Hello, I'm Douglas Murray, and welcome to Uncancelled History. In recent years, statues of Winston Churchill have been assaulted and defaced from London, England to Edmonton, Canada. He's accused of racism, he's accused of colonialism, of being pro-empire, and much more. Winston Churchill was widely regarded, certainly in the English-speaking world, as perhaps the greatest figure of the 20th century. In recent years, that reputation has been very significantly assailed, and in many quarters, it's been reversed. He's been turned from a great hero into a terrible villain. And it's important to get him in a proper context, not just because it's important to try to understand the 20th century in its proper context, but because it's important to try to understand what great men and great women of the past have been capable of, flaws and all. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by the award-winning, best-selling historian, Andrew Roberts. He's the author of numerous books, including biographies of Lord Salisbury, Napoleon, George III, the last King of America, and for our purposes today, his biography of Churchill, Winston Churchill, Walking with Destiny. My great pleasure to welcome Andrew Roberts. Thank you very much, uh, Douglas. It's great to be on the show. Um, I want to start uh, by asking you a very broad question about Churchill, because he's loomed over your life as a historian, as a writer. Uh, among your first books, the biography of one of his nemeses, uh, The Holy Fox, one of the great appeasers uh, in the 1930s, Lord Halifax. You wrote Eminent Churchillians, one of the great books of the other figures in the time. And then uh, recently you wrote your biography of Winston Churchill himself, Walking with Destiny. First of all, why has he loomed so large in your life? And secondly, is it perhaps because he was a great man? <laughs> um, well, you're quite right. This was the fifth book that I'd written with the church in the title or the subtitle. And so really he has, in a sense, dominated my life for the last 30 years. But um, in a sense, hasn't he dominated everybody's life in the last 70 years? Because he is such an epicentral figure. Uh, I'm sure we'll come on to it later, but he's still a major figure in the uh, culture wars. And uh, so... I can't remember a time when I haven't been interested in Winston Churchill. Mm. And what was it, what was it that you think, in, in short, for anyone who is unfamiliar, if there is anyone unfamiliar with him, what in short is it about him that has made him such an important figure? I think uh, it's, it's several things. It's partly that although he was flawed in some ways, he made blunders in some ways, he was somebody who learnt from them. It's an extraordinary redemption story uh, that his tremendous moral courage equaled his physical courage. And uh, therefore, in the 1930s that you mentioned, he was able to say something that nobody else was saying. He was the first person to say it, and he was the loudest voice warning against Adolf Hitler and the rise of the Nazis. And he wasn't listened to, and he was ridiculed, and he was shouted down in the House of Commons, but ultimately he was proved right. And beyond that political aspect, he was then the great war leader for Britain that kept uh, Britain in the war in those crucial months between the fall of Dunkirk in 1940 and the entry of uh, Russia into the war in 1941, Russia and America. And so he was epicentral to saving Western civilization. You mentioned in your biography, Winston Churchill walking with destiny, that he had an idea as a young man that he might not live long. Where did that come from? That came from the enormous number of close brushes with death that he, uh, that he had. He was um, 10 when he suffered from pneumonia at his prep school and very nearly died. Uh, on that occasion, the doctors prescribed brandy to the 10-year-old, uh, <laughs> um, uh, which um, you would have thought might have put off, him off brandy for life, but it certainly didn't. Um, he nearly died in a house fire in a um, accident, a boating accident on Lake Geneva. He nearly died in two car crashes, uh, two plane crashes. Uh, and those are all in peacetime. 
Uh, here in New York, he was uh, run over by a, uh, by a car and very nearly killed on Fifth Avenue and 76th Street. So, you know, it's perfectly understandable, I think, if he thought he was going to die young. And Churchill's father died at the age of 45, and many of his uncles and aunts also died in their 40s. Now, you mention in uh, your biography of Winston Churchill that he had a, an ambition uh, to become, first of all, a hero and then a great man. And he saw it as happening in that order. One of the fantastically interesting things about Winston Churchill's life is not just that he achieves both of these things, but from the point of view of a biographer, you know, the early years of a lot of people are quite dull. Um, uh, the, uh, you've got to get through the childhood chapters, you know, the sort of teens aren't that great by the 20s still. With Churchill, it's exactly the opposite. He's off uh, to a flying start from the get-go. That's right, yes. He uh, recognised that he didn't have very much money and therefore in order to get into Parliament and become a great man, he first had to be a hero. And uh, the way he did that was by fighting in four um, campaigns on four different continents. And then um, ultimately, of course, once he had become something of a great man, he then also fought in the First World War as well. So uh, he fought in, in five wars. and. Um, showed extraordinary bravery in all of them, uh, somehow managed to escape these incredibly close brushes with uh, death um, without a scratch. He, uh, he said that there's nothing more exhilarating in life than to be shot at without result. And he was shot at a lot, you know, from his 21st birthday uh, when he was in Cuba, all the way through to, as I say, uh, commanding a battalion in the Great War. And he's taken uh, hostage and escapes? Absolutely, yes. He was a prisoner of war in Pretoria. And then he... Um, he escaped from the prisoner of war camp, crossed 300 miles of enemy territory. Uh, at one point, he said that a vulture was following him in the expectation and hope of, uh, of a meal. Um, he hid down a mine shaft, um, and uh, when the candle guttered out, he could feel rats scurrying across his face. Uh, tremendous bravery. And of course, he'd, the year before that, taken part in the last great cavalry charge of the British Empire. And he, he, he did this knowingly. I mean, the letters to his mother suggest that he, he sort of knowingly wanted to throw himself at the world. Certainly. And, uh, uh, yes, he had this sense, really from the age of 16, when he was a schoolboy at Harrow, he said to his best friend, Merlin Evans, um, that there shall be great upheavals, uh, terrible struggles in our lives, and I shall be called upon to save England, save London and save the Empire. It's an extraordinary thing, this. When I came across this passage in, in your biography, I was enormously struck by it, because there, there is, you say in your subtitle, Walking with Destiny, but there is this almost mystical element to Churchill. I think, well, the reason that I subtitled it Walking with Destiny was because when he was writing his memoirs, his war memoirs uh, of the Second World War, he said that of the day that he became Prime Minister, on the 10th of May 1940, I felt as if I were walking with destiny and that all my past life had been but a preparation for this hour and for this trial. And he very much believed that. His entire life, up until that point, had been a preparation. And you can see that in so many of the things that he'd uh, done, in the posts that he'd held, uh, in the views that he'd um, uh, held as well, that... Um, he had been preparing himself for 50 years to carry out that prediction that he made to Merlin Evans when he was a 16-year-old uh, schoolboy. What do, you, what do you think it was, though? though? I think it was a combination of things. His, his, this extraordinary belief in private, in personal uh, destiny, I think partly came from his background. His, um, uh, he was a... Um, member of the family of the first Duke of Marlborough, the great uh, hero who uh, defeated the French in the early um, 18th century. And so he, he saw, saw himself as part of the great sort of tapestry and the continuum of, uh, of history. Also, um, his parents, who never really, his father never really thought much of him. His father was a great Victorian statesman, Chancellor of the Exchequer, one of the great orators of the day. And yet he always despised um, his son, Winston. He never really appreciated him. And, uh, and in a sense, I think you can see Winston Churchill's whole uh, life and career as a way of trying to impress the um, shade of his long dead father. Now, you, um, you have a passage in your biography which I, I want to read a short excerpt from because it gets to a root of one of the 
um, things I wanted us to discuss today. And that, that's this. You, you see on page 39, it's early in the book, but you have a passage where you talk about Churchill's attitudes. And you say, today, of course, we know imperialism and colonialism to be evil and exploitative concepts. But Churchill's first-hand experience of the British Raj did not strike him that way. He admired the way the British had brought internal peace for the first time in Indian history, as well as railways, vast irrigation projects, mass education, newspapers, the possibilities for extensive international trade, standardized units of exchange, bridges, roads, aqueducts, docks, universities, an uncorrupt legal system, medical advances, anti-famine coordination, the English language as the first national lingua franca, to telegraphic communications and military protection from the Russian, French, Afghan, Afridi, and other outside threats, while also abolishing sooty, which is the practice of burning widows on funeral pyres. It, it gets us to a very interesting issue because I think that even uh, a few years ago, if we'd been discussing Churchill, uh, been discussing uh, anything to do with um, his leadership, his reputation, uh, it would have been in one tone. People could say that would be um, monotone, but. Uh, but it would have been in one tone. That would have been only of, of praise, admiration, awe, and much more. And in our own time, very, very swift uh, order, that has completely turned around. I wanted to give you an example. Well, could I, could yeah. I just, before you um, uh, give me the example, could I say that always um, all of the responsible and evidence-based uh, um, objective histories of Churchill did accept that he uh, had made blunders. You know, he'd got the abdication wrong, he'd got the gold standard wrong, the, the price that we entered the gold standard, he got the black and tans in Ireland wrong, he got women's suffrage wrong, uh, primarily of course he got the Gallipoli campaign wrong. So I don't think it's true that we would have um, had this discussion and it would have been just in terms of you know awe and appreciation. Mm -hmm. I think we would have gone into the mistakes that he made, but what we wouldn't have uh, perhaps done is um, believed him to have been evil and mm. uh, and so on. You know that is a totally new departure in in Churchill studies. I mean, I, I wanted to give the example of uh, what happened in just uh, over a decade. In two thousand and two, uh, the BBC has its Greatest Britons poll, which is it was done in a number of other countries. Uh, the public vote on who they think the greatest Briton was, and Winston Churchill wins easily in 2002. Um, by 2015, uh, the BBC on its website, uh, when it has a, anything about Churchill, links to its piece, The Ten Greatest Controversies of Winston Churchill's Career. And you get these top ten worst things he did. Um, now, it seems to me that there has been... Um, this has happened very swiftly. And I suppose, first of all, do you agree that's happened? And secondly, why has it happened? Oh, I certainly do agree that it happened, undoubtedly, yes, absolutely. And is, is, I think it's good to point out that it's led by the BBC. Uh, which, by the way, has always hated uh, Winston Churchill, and uh, Winston it kept Churchill off the airwaves during the uh, during the appeasement period because the BBC was so committed to appeasement, um, and so Winston Churchill himself wouldn't be surprised that the people <laughs> lead, leading the attacks on him are the uh, are the sort of descendants of the uh, of the old um, BBC. Um, I think that when you look at some of the um, ones that the, the ideas of these 10 critiques an awful lot of them and i'm sure we'll go into uh, some of them later are um are, are based on complete falsehoods mm. and misunderstandings deliberate um miscontextualization of uh, of the facts about churchill uh, and as i said earlier some of them are, are true you know he did make blunder after blunder the key thing was that he learned from mm. them but it's this interesting disconnect you know the other year when uh, the film darkest hour came out there are all these reports in, in, in Britain, and I think elsewhere, of audiences getting to their feet in the cinema and applauding uh, when uh, they hear the great speech of Winston Churchill's in 1940 to Parliament, the, 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 the finest hour speech. You, you, you have this extraordinary um, admiration uh, from the general public, and yet every time the name appears now in public, Winston Churchill has always got a sort of um, something like a trigger warning. 
or uh, <laughs> some kind of asterisk saying, you know, um, you've got to bear these things in mind. He's very much on the front line of the culture wars. Um, again, he'd be happy with that because he was on the front line of every war. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, yes, I mean, we, we have seen, obviously, in the last 10 years, a sort of explosion of wokery. But um, it's from a very small number of people, frankly. Mm. Uh, when it's always the same, the same old crowd that uh, that uh, crop up and tell you that he was uh, he wanted to use gas against Iraqi tribesmen and so on. And each time you say, well, actually go to mm. Churchill College and read the entire paragraph rather than the three sentences that you always quote, mm. and you'll see that he writes about lacrimotary gas, i.e., tear gas. He's not writing about mustard gas or phosgene gas or lethal gas. So, you know, again and again, these, um, these uh, arguments can be refuted, and I try to refute them, of course, in my, uh, in my book, um, whilst seeing it in the, in the round and just being objective. Just go back to the facts. But that's not what the woke crowd want, mm. because ultimately they're not interested in Winston Churchill primarily. They're interested in attempting to make him part of a much wider story of the essential sort of evil nature of British imperialism and colonialism. Well, let's go through some of those specifics. You, you mentioned the... Uh the accusation that he was in favour of using poison gas on Iraqis. I, I tried to trace that recently, and, and I, I think Noam Chomsky is perhaps the first person to popularise this. No surprises there. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, um, uh, it, but uh, when Chomsky writes about gas, he, he clearly seems to think, or, or tends to think, that he means poison gas. Precisely. But if Chomsky goes to... Um, to the Churchill archives in Cambridge, he can, he can read the actual paper, uh, which makes it very clear in black and white that he's talking about lacrimotary gas, tear gas. Um, another example of something which uh, would have perhaps receded into the margins of history if it hadn't have been brought up by a shadow uh, chancellor of the Exchequer a few years ago, was the incident at Tony Pandy in 1910. <laughs> this is, this, for anyone, anyone watching, I'm assuming sort of most who don't know about this, is, it was quite an extraordinary thing. In 2019, the then uh, Labour shadow chancellor of the Exchequer, John, John McDonnell, was asked uh, on the spot whether Winston Churchill uh, was a hero or a villain. Winston Churchill, hero or villain? <laughs> Tony Pandy, villain. What does he mean? What he means, it's a, it's a rather recondite um, uh, bit of history, as you uh, say, but there is in the uh, Labour demonology of Winston Churchill a myth that Churchill sent troops into the South Wales uh, mining village of uh, Tonipandi to, um, uh, to kill miners, and that two um, Welsh miners were, were killed by soldiers with um, machine guns and bayonets and all this kind of thing. Um, the truth is, again, when you, when you look it into it, he, uh, he sent, it wasn't even him, it was the local um, police uh, uh, commissioner, who sent um, not troops but policemen, into uh, Tonipandi, uh, and they didn't have any bayonets or machine guns or anything like that. They actually uh, fought with um, rolled up Macintoshes. Uh, a Macintosh, I don't know what the American for Macintosh <laughs> is, but it's a sort of like a, like a sou'wester or um, an anorak, essentially, which they rolled up and used as, as, uh, as truncheons, essentially. So, and nobody died. So um, we have this complete myth which uh, just won't, won't die and which people like uh, John MacDonald, who's a perfect example of the kind of person who wants to use Churchill as an ideological tool mm. with which to, uh, to make his, in his case, uh, Marxist, Leninist views uh, more palatable to people. And, um, and there's simply no uh, factual evidence behind it whatsoever. It, it, it does seem like a sort of characteristic example uh, um, somebody's asked, hero or villain, on the plus side, you have the argument for Winston Churchill saving Western civilization. On the other hand, an injured miner hurt by a rolled up Macintosh 30 years earlier. Um, and also, of course, one has to remember that, um, uh, that John McDonnell would probably be the first deputy leader, indeed, certainly the first deputy leader of the Labour Party ever to say villain rather than hero. I mean, mm. Clement Attlee, Clement Attlee, who was the deputy uh, prime minister under 
Winston Churchill um, adored him, you know, admired him endlessly, and made the most wonderful, moving speeches when he died. And uh, so I think it's a sign much more of what's happened to the Labour Party, frankly, mm. than what's happened to, uh, to Winston Churchill or the story of Tony Pandy. Um, let's come on to one which perhaps is more uh, well known, more often cited these days, and indeed uh, was cited in 2021 at a panel at the college named after Churchill in Cambridge. And th that is the whole instant, the affair of the Bengal famine. Uh, perhaps of all of the allegations now made about Winston Churchill, this is the one, I don't know if you agree, that seems to come up most. Oh, and it's the worst, of course, as well, yes, because it essentially makes him into a mass murderer and a, a deliberate war criminal, almost. Um, and uh, I go into this, as you can imagine, as a result, over about six pages in my, um, in my book. And, um, and in that panel that you um, refer to in uh, February 2021, in yeah. all, it was held in all places, with the actual Churchill College, Cambridge, uh, they said that as a result of this, um, Winston Churchill was worse than Hitler. And these are four people on the panel and a moderator and nobody, not one of the people, um, said that is the most absurd statement it's possible to make. Um, do you mind if I just talk about the Bengal family uh, and, and tell you what happened? In October 1942, a terrible typhoon hit the east coast of uh, India and it knocked out all the rail and road communications into uh, Bengal. And the under normal circumstances, what the um, British had done in India for uh, generations before was to buy in rice to alleviate the famine from places like Th uh, Thailand and Malaya um, and uh, uh, Burma. And of course, all of those three places were under the control of the Japanese by uh, 1942. And so that was impossible. Um, it was um, very soon after the typhoon that Churchill started to um, ask the Dominion Prime Ministers and also the President of the United States to send um, food to, um, uh, to India. But the trouble was that the Bay of Bengal was rife with Japanese submarines. And they had, in fact, in the April of 1942, they'd shelled uh, cities on the eastern seaboard. And so these attacks on, on Churchill, which, apart from anything else, are um, uh, historically incorrect, um, what they're saying, um, they simply don't take into account the fact that the Second World War was going on at the time, you know. Mm. And, uh, and it wasn't as simple as uh, just moving um, food into the devastated areas. Mm. Um, I don't think there's any Churchill historian who denies that a terrible famine took place in which millions of people died. But the idea that Churchill um, wanted these people to die and did nothing to help them. And uh, one only has to read the, uh, the telegrams he sent to the Viceroy of India, Lord Wavell, to appreciate that this is absolute rubbish. Mm. The, um, the evidence you lay out in the book shows that, I think, conclusively. But it's, it, it still is a meme which seems to be going around faster than any other. And the reason is that Churchill made um, what we today would be considered to be completely unacceptable racist jokes uh, about Indians. And, uh, and he called them a beastly people with a beastly religion at one point. And, um, and these were, of course, uh, you know, unacceptable remarks to make. But the, but the idea that because he said that uh, to one cabinet minister, by the way, it's not, uh, these aren't um, uh, double um, checked by anybody else. Right. Um, that he wanted these people to die is just an enormous sort of leap of, um, of you know, woke faith, essentially. But, but it's a leap that a lot of people have been willing to make. And it seems that this, this issue of, of the assault on Churchill keeps coming back to um, a few claims about his views on race uh, and religion. There have been attempts to claim that he was anti-Jewish. Uh, as well as anti-Muslim and, and much more. What, yeah. what is true and not in all this? Well, I mean, to, you mentioned the Jewish thing. He was an absolute philo-Semite. He, he, uh, he liked Jews, which, by the way, was rather unlikely un, uh, uh, for somebody of his age and class and background. The, uh, the British uh, Victorian upper classes were notoriously anti-Semitic. Um, 
and uh, and so I think you have to see him in the um, context of being a Victorian. Uh, when he was um, born, Charles Darwin was still alive. Mm. He was um, therefore brought up believing, as everybody else was at the time, this odious and, uh, to our modern ears, uh, completely ludicrous concept of a hierarchy of the races, mm. where, the, uh, uh, where the white man was on top. And um, he considered that to be a scientific fact. Yeah. And this is the reason that uh, he is uh, accused of racism, because he um, essentially did believe that, um, that there were, was a hierarchy of the races. But the idea that that meant that he wanted people who were not white to die in their millions is a complete travesty, because actually uh, he also believed that there was a hierarchy of the classes. And he thought it, that having been born in a palace, the grandson of a duke, he had a profound responsibility to the, um, uh, with that kind of privilege. It was, profound responsibility to everybody else in society. And that's what drove him, this sort of the concept of Tory democracy. You know, that he's, he, ha he had to sort of pay for his privilege in a way that helped ordinary people. Yeah. And, uh, and that extended to the empire as well. He, of course, he was proud of how many um, people were born into the empire, of how much it was growing mm. in uh, terms of numbers. And so uh, I'm afraid it's a, it's a historical inaccuracy, but also, as I say, as I keep saying, it's also a um, ideological, political campaign that's being waged. It's, it's very interesting. I, I went over again uh, the speech uh, that Churchill uh, made in Parliament in 1920 in the wake of the massacre at Amritsar. Um, and uh, the, the allegation that, uh, as you say, that, that, that Churchill's views on race mean that he positively wanted people of other races to die or be killed is, among other things, shown to be absolute rot by the fact that what he says in response to the massacre at Amritsar is unbelievably and completely condemning of what happened. Uh, Absolutely, he insisted. Uh, it's the pharmacology speech, it's called, and it was. Um, uh, it insisted on the uh, immediate cashiering um, of the general responsible for the. We should uh, explain what Amritsar is. Amritsar was a, was was a terrible. It was in many ways the lowest moment of the in the history of the British Empire. When in April 1919, a um, a crowd, some would say a mob, but anyway a protesting demonstration, uh, was uh, fired upon. Um, they had been warned that they were going to be fired upon, but uh, and to disperse, but. Uh, um, but nonetheless, they were fired upon by a um, group, a, a, a unit of um, of Gurkhas in the Sikh city of Amritsar, under the command of General Dyer, a Briton, and uh, 379 people were killed, and um, it it did prevent the. Um, the brewing revolution in the Punjab that uh, General Dyer and others worried about. But of course, it was still a, uh, a monstrous thing to have happened. And, um, and I the uh, Churchill, then a government minister, denounced it mm. uh, in the House of Commons. And, uh, and that, by the way, is only one of a many, many examples of uh, Churchill's uh, standing up, essentially, for the native peoples of the empire. Mm. When he was uh, undersecretary at the colonies, Again and again, he um, he defended the um, rights of natives against the, um, the British settlers. Uh, when he um, down in South Africa supported the uh, uh, people of um, Basutu land and Bekuana land uh, against the South African um, government, you know it, it happens again and again in his. Uh, he he fought, of course, mm. uh, to protect Punjabi tribesmen. Uh, as a young man against the Afridi and the Talib, um, i.e. The, the sort of great-grandfathers of the Taliban. Uh, and you see it in the Sudan when he fought um, to abolish the practice of slavery that, uh, that mm. the Khalifa um, was pursuing. So, you know, here is a man with a lifetime of um, 
of work and, and sometimes physical bravery mm. for the uh, betterment of the lives of native peoples, who is accused of, um, of wanting to um, slaughter them on a, on a mass scale by not giving them food in Bengal. It and just doesn't, it doesn't stack up um, it, when you look at the overall life trajectory of the man. And there's something else about the, 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 the wider picture here as well, which is uh, uh, the, uh, the debate in the House of Commons about Amritsar, Churchill says that what had happened is, quote, without precedent or parallel in the modern history of the British Empire. That's just part of his, his denunciation. But there's something interesting about the, 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 the Amritsar issue I just wanted to get onto in the wider picture, which is, of course, and this isn't by any means to underplay or downplay uh, what happened, but if this had been any other empire other than the British Empire, nobody would know the name of Amritsar. No, of course. I mean, no. Had this been the Germans in Here um, against the Hereros in um, uh, down in southwest Africa, or if it had been, frankly, you know, some of the things the French were doing in Algeria at the time, let alone the Spanish and Italian empires, and certainly the Belgian Empire in. Uh, in the Congo, um, there's no way that this general would have been um, cashiered, you know, uh, without pension. There, he would have um, not, not been heard of, you know, this would have been covered up. Mm. But the British Empire tended to um, follow the common law and to give rights to uh, the native peoples. And, um, and so as a result, it's uh, widely seen as, uh, as the lowest moment in the British uh, Empire's history. However, one mustn't mistake the Amritsar massacre for the other um, massacres that have taken place in Amritsar, such as the one that killed 600 people when Indira Gandhi um, fired on the Sikh uh, mm. Golden Temple in 1984. Don't mistake those two massacres at all. Yes, well, this, this, this brings on this sort of crucial issue because, of course, as we're, uh, everyone's always re-evaluating history, or obviously are in our own day, but th there is something curious about this, isn't it, that there are... Um, the, 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 the name of Churchill comes up and we immediately hear the negatives and we will get back onto the positives, I promise. Good, it's good. We, we, <laughs> we get immediately onto the negatives. Um, you mention uh, the British Empire and you immediately get on only to focusing on, on, on uh, Amritsar, on other, um, others of the, of, of the terrible things that occurred. Why are we finding it so hard to get all of these things into any proper context? It feels to me as if we had a um, we had one view, we've swung wildly in another direction, and th there's a uh, very close uh, connection now between the things that are said uh, about Churchill, in particular, and the things that are done. Um, uh, we seem to live in an age where what a Noam Chomsky or somebody like that gets wrong one day ends up being taken to the streets pretty swiftly afterwards. I wanted to give an example. Um, in uh, Edmonton, Canada in uh, 2021, uh, the life-size statue of Winston Churchill uh, was, uh, th again, for the second time, was assaulted by uh, protesters throwing red paint over him. Uh, that's perhaps less uh, uh, important than what uh, the local officials uh, um, said. The local mayor uh, of Edmonton said in response to this attack on the, the statue of Churchill, I don't know the intent behind the vandalism, but I know historical monuments and sculptures here and elsewhere are at the heart of an emotional debate regarding what legacies and stories we venerate as a society. I believe there are more productive ways to move society along towards a more inclusive and uplifting future. Um, <laughs> Sounds a bit like that mayor in, uh, in um, Jaws, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yes, I mean... Statues, I think, are the beginning of it. Um, schools have been changing their names. Uh, there's a school in, in uh, California that um, doesn't want to be named after George Washington, um, of all people. You know, statues have been attacked, including that of Abraham Lincoln. Um, we've ha had, it, it seems that there can't be a demonstration in Parliament Square any longer without them either, the police either boarding up the statue of Winston Churchill or it being um, attacked and vandalised in some way. Um, they, uh, the, the same Black Lives Matter demo that uh, attacked um, Churchill, or tried to attack Churchill, uh, also um, uh, 
vandalize the cenotaph. Yeah. So the you know, cenotaph to the, the dead. The cenotaph World to Wars. the dead to the dead in the First World War and the Second World War. The, the national memorial to the to the dead, um, and uh, so I think it's um, you know there is obviously nothing if you don't venerate that. What do you venerate, frankly? Um, and if you uh, and they clearly don't venerate that, and so this is a, a proper sort of cultural um, struggle that's taking place. But the good thing is, and we see this uh, more and more pleasingly. Um, you know, I'm certainly not a defeatist in the struggle. I think we could win this struggle so long as ordinary people are given the, their say. Mm. And in Sheffield recently, um, ordinary people uh, voted to keep um, a, a statue there. Uh, whenever people have local referenda on these things, they don't want the statue of uh, Sir Francis Drake or Robert Baden-Powell um, taken down because they're, they're of course, part of the street furniture that they've grown up with, but also they are able, all intelligent people, are able to contextualise greatness. Mm. Uh, and because somebody was uh, uh, great enough to have a statue put up to them, that doesn't mean that you can't contextualise it. But it doesn't. It, it, you know, the idea of just pulling it down mm. is um, a... Uh, is an absurdity in my view. I was very moved in the summer of 2020 in the wake of the BLM George Floyd protests that spilled from America to Britain and other countries. I was very moved by the fact that the morning after uh, the Cenotaph and other national memorials, including the, the statue to Winston Churchill in Parliament Square were uh, vandalised, assaulted, graffitied over, that a, that a group of, of young men and women voluntarily mm. came out the next morning and started scrubbing the graffiti off. Mm. Yeah. Now, one, one of the protesters who was obviously in support of the graffiti said to these, these young men and women who turned out to have come from the, where they were part of the household cavalry and were mm. doing this in their spare time, mm. um, one, one person uh, who obviously supported the graffitiing um, said, oh, look at you, you know, your, your precious memorials, you can't even allow... Uh, this BLM graffiti to be up even for a day because of your precious memorials. And it, mm. it, the taunting tone in that struck mm. me. Yes, yes. Because, of course, they are precious. The, the, the monuments to the dead of the two world wars are very precious to the British people because they commemorate our ancestors. They commemorate the people who gave their lives so that we can be free. Assaulting the statue of Winston Churchill, again, seems to hit right at the heart of us. Perhaps this is, and we'll get on to this, perhaps that's the point, but, but it seems clear that for the British public, this is the heart of us. Churchill is somehow at the very centre of our, our sense of ourselves as a people, and as a people who did good in the world. Precisely, yes, and who ultimately, of course, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, kept Britain in the war against the Nazis, uh, which ultimately was um, was successful. And so, you know, if you even for one moment consider what would happen to, well, let's take the Black Lives Matter um, campaign. What would have happened to black people if uh, the Nazis had won the Second World War? I have to say, it would have been a jolly sight more unpleasant than what would have happened to people like you and me, um, Douglas. You know, uh, the, um, the way in which the Nazis treated um, non-Aryan people was, uh, was genuinely genocidal. Um, and so if anyone should be happy and proud and, and, and pleased that uh, Winston Churchill did what he did, it should, in fact, probably be the um, Black Lives Matter um, supporters, even more than people like us. And that, uh, that, that sense of sort of getting this out of proportion, again, it seems to be something to do with education, um, some kind of finessing around certain figures and a forgetting of the wider picture. As a historian, why, why, why do you think that has happened? Why do you think it's it's possible uh, from everyone from an academic at Churchill College Cambridge to say Churchill was worse than Hitler, to, to, to a sort of um, general educational sort of malaise of failing to understand what's what. Well, there you've put your finger on it, education. Um, I think that there's been a uh, huge change in the educational establishment since the 1960s, really, since the uh, generation of teachers who came in and um, 
started to, to dominate schools mm -hmm. and who brought with them a agenda that um, was frankly opposed to the kind of things that Winston Churchill stood for. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, especially in the universities, where they seem to have a sort of um, a, a lock on, uh, on, on many of the uh, British universities, most perhaps, um, to be in favour of, um, of Winston Churchill is tremendously unusual uh, to the point that, as I say, not one of the people on that panel in February 2021 was willing to gainsay a statement that uh, he was as bad as Hitler. So we have got to this extraordinary um, disconnect between ordinary British people who um, think that that's a disgusting and disgraceful uh, remark to make and academia uh, where you can say it and no one will contradict you. Uh, you may have forgotten about this but many years ago I certainly haven't forgotten about it you were in a debate in London uh, and there was again it sounds like I'm beating up on Churchill College Cambridge today but why not I think there was an academic from Churchill College Cambridge again that day on the panel opposite you I think it was for Intelligence Squared the debate about uh, the origins of the Second World War. I remember everybody got lost uh, in, the, in, in the debate, apart from yourself. There was, there was endless discussion about uh, steel tariffs and, 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 and <laughs> iron, and all sorts of things. And I remember at some point, the, the moderator turned to you and, and, and said, Andrew Roberts, why did World War II begin? And you, you said, World War II began because Hitler invaded Poland. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm afraid I, I am an evidence-based politician. Uh, sorry, uh, um, evidence-based historian, you know. Uh, and um, so uh, thank you for that. You know, uh, I, I'd forgotten uh, about that. But ultimately, it is very easy to... Um, uh, to forget the it's, obvious. It, it seems it? to be, doesn't it? I mean, I, it, it sticks out of my mind because here was a group of very clever people, very informed people. They could, they could get into all the minutiae and all sorts of issues, but the basic facts had somehow evaded them. Yes, well, that happens uh, quite a lot in, uh, in academia. And uh, people, I don't know whether there's an element, I think, of people just um, uh, showing off how clever they are, you know, right. and wanting to over-intellectualise everything, and uh, ultimately to forget the, um, the obvious uh, sort of truths. Mm. And, um, and uh, hyper-specialisation somewhere in that? Oh, there's a lot of that, yes, exactly. No, I know, you can get a, um, you can get a, a post at an um, academic institution, a university, uh, if you are the, uh, the sort of world expert on uh, Hampshire turnpikes at the turn of the 18th century. Uh, but if you want to do the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, <laughs> it would be next to impossible. The, uh, it's something that um, you have also in this country, in America, uh, some over-specialisation to the point that it's become um, ludicrous, really. But it, it, it seems to me in America and in Britain in particular that that the over-specialisation is partly responsible for this, that the over-specialisation means that the people who are keeping the national story and the national truths at heart are the non-specialists. That's not a bad thing as far as um, people like me. And I do believe there's also such a thing as the general reader. Mm -hmm. We were told and have been told for years um, by... Uh, by publishers and others, that, uh, that the general reader is dead. Well, I don't believe that. I think he or she is very much alive and very much willing to read books on lots of different subjects and also wanting to understand big subjects. Mm. My friend uh, Simon Seabag Montefiore is about to bring out a history of the world. Yes. Now, can you imagine any academic that would do that? They would have done 35, uh, 40 years ago. J.M. Roberts, Professor J.M. Roberts wrote a history of the world. But today... You know, it would be impossible to consider such a thing, but people do want to read books like that. Yes, or Harari's uh, Sapiens, a, a history of the whole species. Um, yeah, I did ask C uh, Simon Seabag Montefiore where he started, where he's starting with his, his, his history of the world. Yes, uh, exactly. Is it going to be the dinosaurs and, it, and so it, on? But, it, it's no, an, I think it's, it's an amazing to, thing. It's going to be um, the beginning of actual proper history, as in, as in, we're certain that something happened. I think. Yes, but but. Just, just a, um, one thing on the. I just come back to this thing that it seems so important that 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 there are figures like that Churchill that is, are kept in in the national heart in the UK and and in the US. National figures in the US like Jefferson or Washington that are kept in the national heart, and yet at the same time, every time they're in the news, 
It's just the negative. That's right. And of course, in this city, New York, um, uh, the statue of Thomas Jefferson has been removed from City Hall. And I think it's a tremendously dangerous moment uh, in a nation's history when it uh, trashes its founding fathers and trashes the, um, therefore, the ideas of the founding fathers. Yes, of course, uh, 41 of the 56 signatories of the Declaration of Independence were slave owners. However, they also had the courage to stand up against the most powerful nation in the world, to uh, create their own country, and to um, had the genius to create a constitution that um, has allowed a very, you know, viciparious continent to stay together as a single um, political entity. Mm. But it, it is, it is this apparent, consistent trend in our in our age that this thing that there are there are effectively two different forms of memory or something like that going on. There is a collective memory, and then there is this attempt to to to, to alter that to make people forget things that they they knew. Their instinct is to get to their feet and applaud Winston Churchill's finest hour speech. Their instinct is to feel pride. And yet from somewhere from the outside is this constant attempt to hammer away and change them. I mean, in a sense, of course, all history is revisionist history. Every, every history book revises what came before. You do need to, um, to have a new look at everything occasionally. And that, uh, that's the uh, only sensible way. You can't stop history. But, um, but there has been, in recent years, a new uh, viciousness towards um, national heroes. Mm. And um, almost there's the sense that there's no such thing as a hero, that uh, everyone is much more feet of clay than, than statue, you know, than, uh, than stone statue. So um, that's, I, I think, also another um, aspect of this. It's an ideological thing as well, that the individual uh, can't make any difference, that the individual is not uh, somebody to look up to, that the only people to look up to are the masses, mm. um, that dark impersonal forces as T.S. Eliot put it, are the drivers behind uh, history and individuals can't be. And we know where that comes from ultimately. It comes from the determinists and it comes from the Marxists. Um, you, you mentioned this at the end of your um, biography of Churchill, the extent to which as you, you, um, you say that uh, your, some of your final lines refer to this, that, that despite everything that he suffered in his life, all this, the setbacks and, and much more, his story is a great life story of success, of triumph, triumph over odds, personal odds, and indeed worldwide odds. Um, this view of history as it were, the, is now derided, it's put in quotation marks, the great man view of history. Um, but Churchill is, if anyone, is the person who has... The quotation marks have to be taken away. I think so. And also, um, I mean, there shouldn't be quotation marks there anyhow, of course, because great men and women in history have been deciders, have been decision makers who have uh, made things happen. You know, you wouldn't have got France invading Russia in 1812 were it not for Napoleon. You might well not have had Britain continuing to fight on in, uh, in May 1940 uh, without Churchill. And so uh, it seems to me to, to go against the grain to deny both that there are great men and women and that therefore those men and women are great. And that they direct the course of human events. See, there, it seems to me that there's, underneath the level we were just talking about, there's this, there's this level at which there's a desire to introduce lethargy into the society. Because if you say to people, you are merely um, a cog in the wheel, as the Marxist view of history sees it, and, or part of a group-based, class-based, or other, other based entity. Um, there's not very much you can do other than go along with your group. Absolutely, yes, that agency no longer matters, that, mm. um, uh, that you might as well just sort of um, not get politically involved mm -hmm. because, uh, because ultimately um, the, the history is moving along predetermined lines. Um, in the Marxist case, obviously, the dictatorship of the proletariat and mm. so on. Um, and the more I, I read history, the less likely that seems to me, because um, history doesn't have prearranged lines. The, um, 
Uh, no one's getting getting better or getting worse. Um, of course, there are great scientific advances that make life um, better, mm. but um, but the uh, human soul hasn't. Uh, improved terribly much I don't think in the last 3,000 years I'll read Seabag's book and see what he thinks about it but um, but the um, it's possible as happened in 1917 in uh, Russia for this train to be shut the train of history to be shunted into a siding for 75 years yes or or as happened in Germany between 1939 and 1945 um, sorry 1933 and 1945 to actually go in reverse yes um, I mean I think that the old Whig interpretation of history in which people think that uh, everything's um, naturally improving just can't exist after Auschwitz right right and this is something we're still struggling through. This is something that the um, that the progressives won't and cannot accept because yeah. it goes ultimately against the um, idea of history being a part of the dialectic. Yes, it's, it's that, that, that view that it's all getting better, but you have the caveat of World War One and World War Two. <laughs> yes, and the Holocaust. And the know, Holocaust. Yes, exactly. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and loads of things that are happening um, uh, now. I mean, the rise of the Communist Party in China mm. and the increasing totalitarianism in China seems to be a classic example of why the Whig interpretation of history just simply can't be right. But there's this, this crucial thing, just to bang on once more about it, this crucial thing that, that this, the, 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 the life of Winston Churchill, perhaps more than any other person, demonstrates that one man or one woman can alter the course of all of human history. Precisely. And that uh, is something that we should celebrate and something that we should learn from and something that should remind us uh, to, when we see it in our own time, to, uh, to do something to, to help that process. You know, I mean, if we see somebody who is able to change uh, uh, the course of history in a positive way, um, then we should uh, try and help them. Um, I want to bring us to a close, but before I do, of course, Winston Churchill won the Nobel Prize, um, but won it in literature, which uh, is, is, is an odd footnote. He was, he story. was the, uh, I think he's the only person in history to have been um, disappointed when he won the Nobel Prize in literature, because <laughs> of course he thought he'd won it for peace, Yes, uh, which is what he wanted. However, uh, when you see the list of the six books that the Nobel Prize Committee um, cite as the reason for the prize, he so deserved that prize. I mean, what an extraordinary output. He, he wrote 37 uh, books, and uh, certainly those six that were mentioned, but many others also, are truly impressive mm. works of literature, in my view. I wanted to bring you to, to one um, that's always fascinated me of his works, which is that, that odd dialogue story he wrote in conversation with his dead father. The Dream. The Dream. Yes, it's a very strange thing, isn't it? Uh, it's in 1947, so after the um, victory in the Second World War, he's painting one day in uh, his, uh, his painting studio at Chartwell, his uh, lovely manor house in Kent. And um, he sees the, uh, the ghost, essentially, of his uh, late father, Lord Randolph Churchill, and they have a long conversation mm. about all sorts of, um, of things. Uh, but at no point does he point out to his father that he'd been instrumental in helping win the Second World War. And so his father ends, leaves the dream, um, believing that, uh, that his, fa his son Winston was uh, an artist, was a painter. Uh, so it is a, it's a fascinating thing because, as I say, I think you can see Churchill's life very much as being an attempt to impress this, this long dead father. Mm. But when he had an opportunity to do it in the dream, he fails to. And each time the fa his late father, the ghost of his father, said, asks him about something, asks him about the, the monarchy, and he says it goes on. Churchill's reply, it, it all goes on. Yes, and one of the great lines also is, of course, the, he says, and what about Russia? Is it still ruled by the Tsars, his father asks. And he says, yes, it is, but they call them a different name now. That's right. That's <laughs> a wonderful dig against Stalin, I thought. That's right. Um, thank you so much, Andrew, for, uh, for joining me today and talking about uh, uh, Churchill. Um,
it, it does seem to me so important that people know and remember great men and great women and remember them in their pro pro proper context, uh, a context which seems to be almost deliberately being taken from them. In ancient Greece, there was a law in the city-states against denigrating your gods and heroes. And uh, although, of course, I'm not uh, in favour of a law about it, I think that what they got right was that um, if you do uh, denigrate your, your heroes, then um, for, in, for society, that way, madness lies. Very well said. Thank you, Andrew Roberts. Thank you very much.